Pete Drummond, welcome to Australian Musician. Thanks for having me, Fred. Uh, you play numerous uh, instruments, but uh, when did drums come into your life? Uh, drums was there forever, ever since I can remember. So I think I started, my first kit I had when I was three, and before that there's pictures of me banging on buckets and pots and pans, and it was just actually all I ever thought about. I remember it, even though I was little, I just remember desperately wanting to play drums. So my uncle played the drums, and that was, you know, I, I was basically hooked <laughs> just from watching him. So. Um, drum heroes as you grew up and started learning drums? Yep, I think initially it was just uh, listening to pop songs like you know we, we really loved my brother and I loved Kiss and Skyhooks and you know all sorts of you know top 40 stuff and Ringo um, and then when I got to high school I heard um, Virgil Donati and that changed my life forever and um, Dave Weckl and Vinnie Collier guys like that yeah and um, that's what really made me want to play and practice. And, and um, when I heard uh, about Virgil and how, uh, how much he practiced, I thought, okay, well, you know, I need to, need to get the show on the road and <laughs> log some hours. What was your first professional band? The first professional band uh, was the Bushwhackers. Yeah, so um, I was still in year 12 at school and playing with them and uh, went to Tamworth and. You know, and I was with them for quite a few years, which was great because that got me into the country scene and, and I met a lot of people and played a lot of gigs and sessions yeah. in that world. Um, you started playing with Dragon in 2005, I yep. think, uh, the Mark Williams version. Yes. Uh, were you a Dragon fan? Massive up? Dragon fan, yeah. Yeah, um, Dreams of Ordinary Men was a record that I had on cassette and I wore it out. It was, um, you know, in my Walkman. I remember I had two weeks off school once because I had tonsillitis or something and I was in bed and that was the only thing I listened to on repeat for two weeks, that record. And we used to play Rain um, in our cover band that I had all through school and I used to play and I was the lead singer. And So even still now after almost 17, 18 years, when I look at Todd, sometimes we're playing Rain and I just have to pinch myself because I'm like, this guy wrote this, this is crazy. Yeah. Um, so you've been with Dragon for almost uh, going on two decades now. Yeah. When you think of uh, your time with Dragon, what are your strongest memories? Um, well, for me, it's really been about the support and the nurturing that all of the guys have given to me. Because I've always written songs and I've always sung and I've always played lots of different instruments, but professionally, until Dragon, I didn't do any of that stuff. I sort of hid it away or, or just felt like I shouldn't, you know, I should just concentrate on being known as a drummer. And Todd, has really helped me to embrace all of the parts of myself and you know was really encouraging of the songwriting getting me to mix and produce the records and and you know play keyboards and drums live and all sorts of stuff so it's just been incredible yeah and what's the plan for dragon going forward just to keep going until forever i guess you know until there's holograms and digital avatars <laughs> <laughs> the songs belong to the people, you know, and the band's been so, through so many changes already and people just have str such a strong love for those songs that I think that they need to be played in whatever form that is, you know. Yeah. Another band you play with is uh, Southern Sons. Yep. Um, you're playing Virgil Donati's drum parts. Uh, Crazy. How did you approach that initially? Um, well, for me, Obviously, I'm a massive fan of Virgil's, and I was a huge fan of Jack's. Like, his singing was, he was like my singing idol, even more than Farnham or any of those other guys. I just loved Jack's voice. So, um, my, my love of the songs sort of dictates what I'm playing, but I think the way that I approached it was to think, okay, well, I'm a big, massive fan of that band, and if I went to the gig and someone else was playing drums and they didn't play the signature things that Verge played, I would want my money back. So I play some of those things, and then the rest of it I just try and approach as I think Virgil would play it. You know, he, he's got a great pocket and a great sense of time, but he's always stretching and, and searching for a new and a different way to play things, so it's not just a set part every time. So I try and have that same spirit. Yeah, uh, another band you play with is uh, Thirsty Merc. Um, 
uh, Ray Disselwage is currently playing with Joe Satriani. Yeah, and he's having a hell of a time. Yeah. Uh, so when he comes back, are you available for that as well? Yeah, definitely. And so I, I get to fill in there. There was a period of time where I was doing that really regularly, and now I just, because I've got so much else going on, they use a few different guys. But every time I do it, I love it. It's really fun. It's such a great gig because it is, again, that same thing where it's a got these pop songs that are simple and got great pockets, but everyone in that band is exceptional, you know, musically, so the sound checks get pretty wild. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you've just released a solo album. Uh, it's called yeah. Eerie. Um, where does the title come from? Um, the title is, it came from basically 10 years on and off with a psychologist and trying to um, really embrace and be proud of all of the different things that I can do rather than just, as I said, just you know, compartmentalizing things. And um, so it was about sort of having a full wingspan, you know, and uh, and I also like the palindrome, so, you know. <laughs> uh, I believe it was a lockdown project. Yeah, yeah, it was. So um, because I just finished building the studio here, uh, I just got in here and, and started writing and it, it sort of, happened because some of the songs I had had written before uh, and had them in drop boxes and I one of the songs in particular I thought oh, I really would love it if Jack would sing it right so I sent it to him and he he loved the song but then he was saying oh you should sing it and I was like hang on no you, you can't say that and then he was he he basically just gave me a license to sing you know and in my in my mind he was like just so encouraging of that and then he said it was the guitar record that he always wanted to play on as a session guy because he loves Mr Mr and he loves all of those same bands you know that I love and and that the records you know sort of inspired by and so he he did an exceptional job he just made it completely 80s in a very cool way yeah uh it's certainly a, a love letter to the 80s as you say in your press release yeah um how did you go collecting the sounds that you used? Yeah, well, I think for me, um, as I listen to records over time, because I, I guess I'm a synth fan, you know, I'm a real fan of synthesizers, so then I would listen to a sound and, and sort of do a deep dive for what I thought it might have been played on, like a DX7 or a Prophet or any of those things. And so then I've got um, some physical synths and then a lot of... Um, you know, just soft synths and stuff. And so I would just fish around for sounds and then manipulate sounds and and uh, just till they arrive at the right sort of blend. Yeah. Uh, you've got all your mates playing on it. Uh, yeah. Jack, Jack Jones, uh, Steve Bull from Ice House, Steve Belby, Ray Thistlewaite. Uh, I guess because it was during the pandemic that was done remotely. Yeah, absolutely. Even Jack's stuff, um, it was a matter of me sending sending the files and then sending it back and... and um, and we did some swapsies, you know, so I did drums for projects that they were working on as well. So. Yeah. Uh, were there any albums from the 80s you saw as benchmarks for this album? Well, Whispering Jack, for one, you know, like, I think that's one of my all-time favourite records, you know. I mean, Farnham it is, you know, God, but that record in particular, I think David Hirschfelder is, is such a huge voice of what that is and that... I've always loved so that was sort of on the list of things to Frankenstein and then there was Welcome to the Real World the Mr. Mr. Record um, Peter Gabriel So and um, things like Don Henley's Boys of Summer so and there's uh, Van Halen 5150 was a record I'd, I loved so I just put them all in a blender and bits came out you know yeah. but what was the starting point for the songs how did you build them uh, most of the time I start with a melody, yeah. I've got a bank of voice memos where I just, if I get an idea, I'll just sing it. And so I really always write from a chorus backwards most of the time. So I'll have, because to me that's sort of the landing point. That's the thing that, that I will strive to find something that's catchy but not too cheese ball or anything like that and then find the other parts of that. So generally melody and then harmony and then the last thing to happen is the drums you know yeah 
Um, speaking of drums, let's talk about your gear. Uh, yeah. Tell me about your kit. Uh, this is a DW Design kit, which I love, and um, it's. Uh, I used to play a lot of different drums um, in the studio as well. You know, I've got vintage drums in the shed, and and before I had this kit, I would swap things out a lot more. But now this just sits here. I don't actually move. <laughs> I might change the snare drum occasionally, but I love these drums. I really do. Yeah. Um, what about the symbols? What, what do you ask uh, from your symbols? Um, for me, they have to be thin enough that they don't have a big sort of a bell clonky sort of sound. Um, but that they've still got some top end and they're not too trashy. And these Paiste traditionals are exactly that. They're not too, too... Yeah, I, I think for me, I, I need them to cover a variety of genres, so I don't want something that's just like big, heavy, cut through the mix rock symbol or something that's just a really washy and buttery, and that's why this setup sort of works for everything. So. Um, what about sticks? Are you fussy about sticks? I oh, definitely, um, but I've got the Pro Marks, um, and, uh, and again, it's great. I just found the stick I like, and I'm stuck with it. So. Yeah. Um, do you use electronics at all with dragon? Yeah, um, I do. What I tend to do, and I'm getting back to it now at the moment, is I have um, a little keyboard that I'll play with my right hand and playing the drums with my left, and and I use Ableton because we don't. The guys prefer not to sort of play to tracks, and I prefer not to play to tracks as well. So it just means when I'm doing that, we can keep things really open, and I've, and I can sort of half DJ and play keyboards and play drums and, and it keeps me occupied. <laughs> um, another project uh, we didn't mention uh, and I think another lockdown project, Light Sleep Beyond. Yeah. Uh, with Jeremy Barnes. Tell yeah. me about that. Yeah, okay. Well, Jeremy and I have been friends for a long time, like a couple of a couple of decades. And um, and we played on each other's records and, and uh, we basically collaborated. We, it was actually because of the Melbourne Guitar Show, because uh, I think Rob asked him to do something for the live streams, and so Jeremy and I thought, oh, we'll, we'll do something together, and then that became, and then we thought, oh, maybe we should get a band name for this, and so then we, we started that. So once we did a couple of the songs, we thought, oh, maybe we should do a whole record. So I ended up writing on my own about half of that, and Jeremy had a couple of his own, and then the rest were, were collaborations. So, yeah, that was the other end of the pool. I had the pop song and then the fusion thing. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the Melbourne Guitar Show. You, you played the online version for us. Yeah. Uh, in 2017, you also played our uh, drum and percussion show in Sydney. Yeah. What are, you, what are your memories of that? Well, my biggest memory was um, that I did a masterclass, and Verge and Thomas Lane both decided to turn up and watch it and it was funny because I messaged Virgil before uh, before the Sydney drum show and I and I said oh unfortunately I'm not going to be there on the Saturday so I won't see you and Thomas and he messaged me back he said no that's all right we're coming to see you and I was like no please don't but he was he was so amazing at the end of it you know he he gave me a big rap and we hung out and you know he was very very complimentary and he's just been again you know so encouraging for me to just get my stuff out there and because of that I started my um, online drum course site that I've got drumdna.com and I wouldn't have done that before because I was sort of like you know he he's constantly putting things out and constantly you know has new things new material and so it's helped me to just yeah. Um, you mentioned your online uh, tuition website. Um, when you were growing up learning drums, what was there for you? Videotapes? Or? Yeah, videos. For, I mean, in the beginning, just records and cassettes. Um, my dad's a musician and a, like a singer-songwriter, and, and um, he had a reel-to-reel -reel machine, and I used to just you'd record things from vinyl onto the reel-to-reel -reel and then flick them to half-speed and then just wind it back and and listen to bits and pieces um and then yeah instructional videos you know just dci music videos and that was it and i had one teacher and and then at a certain point i just started to 
practice a lot and you know just really wanted to get as good as I could at, on the drums yeah so what's your approach to teaching what's the main thing you try to convey well for me I my main approach is obviously to have people be enthused about it you know I don't like to be a gatekeeper of any particular thing to say you know for instance you can't go learn a song until you've done your rudiments you know uh, I try to make sure that I'm helping to move somebody towards their goal rather than a sort of fixed uh, model of what I think it should be. And the other thing is is really to try to help people to get shortcuts in a way, you know, because I've done enough trial and error that I can go, oh, you know, I, I sort of tried that and it, did, it took a while and it didn't really work. So it's sort of good to be able to distill some things down for people and hopefully get them to their goals a bit quicker. Yeah. Um any thoughts on playing your solo album live at some point? Yeah, definitely. It's a, I, um, I did a little dip my toe in the water. I did a support set for Steve Balby in St Kilda recently with my, um, my daughter Maddie Bay and she sings BVs with me and she's great. And, uh, and I was just doing sort of keys and guitar and looping and, and uh, I, I really want to do some more of that so it'll happen. I possibly do some Dragon supports in the next year. Um, and what's on for the rest of 2022 into 2023? Yeah, so the rest of this year, um, Southern Suns and More Dragon. I'm actually playing keyboards and guitar for Kate Sobrano um, a couple of times. And then Dragon's going to New Zealand to do a tour with uh, UB40 and Jefferson Starship. So it's going to be great. Yeah. And, yeah. And what's the, the grand plan for Pete Drummond? Well, the grand plan for me is to continue making a living out of music in Australia. That's, I mean, I think that is a blessing in itself, just um, doing that. I'm going to America next year because Thomas Lang's invited me to go on to Drum Channel, and that's in April. And um, I'm going to do some courses and lessons for them over there and go to NAM and, and um, so yeah, looking at sort of expanding internationally a little bit more and just making another Eerie record next year and another Fusion record and just on and on. Just keep keep the train moving now it's out from the station. Oh, Pete, it's been great to chat and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's my absolute pleasure. I 